بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله على نعمة الاسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الامجد والمحمود الاحمد حبيب اله العالمين ابي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه الملتجبين ومن سار على هديهم وتمسك بهم الى قيام يوم الدين ثم اما بعد respected elders brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um, allow me also over the next two days today and tomorrow to offer my heartfelt condolences to sahib al-asr wa al-zaman ajalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif on the martyrdom of none other than Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallamu alayh and as similar condolences is extended to all mu'minin and mu'minat around the world on this sad and uh, heartfelt occasion marking the martyrdom anniversary of Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallamu Yesterday we were talking about how scientific evidence has come to prove and corroborate that neglect, neg negligence of the soul does not make it go away. It does not simply disappear. It comes to haunt us in different ways and in particular to come to haunt us in addiction, a loss of meaning, uh, you know, uh, crime, and so on and so forth. And I stopped just short of continuing my discourse on the actual factual evidence that are available to, to us, the data, the information that is available to us after so many studies that have been performed in the West, in particular, in regard to this particular fact. Allow me to continue what I had to speak about yesterday but we we were caught up by time and i will continue our talk in regard to the subject matter uh, at hand the, uh, herbert benson is a cardiologist at harvard medical school and a chief of behavioral medicine at the corners medical center in boston he had this to say in regard to the absence of spirituality or in regard to the neglectful aspect of spirituality. And these are professionals. These are not your average, you know, Tom and Dick Harry doctor who practices around some sort of a corner, you know, or in a, in a, in a grocery shop. These are top uh, uh, medical experts in the field of human anatomy and psychology. And when they come forward and they say these things, it is not befitting for us to dismiss their findings simply because I may, as a layman, see otherwise or think otherwise. Now, we know from an intellectual point of view, if you want to dismiss an argument or falsify an argument, you must falsify or dismiss an argument by another valid fact. It is not befitting for an intellectual human being to dismiss an argument on the basis of his own opinion. Because if you do so, or if I do so, then I become egoistic on the, per, on the part of my own egocentral basis of what I think is right. And that is something that is totally condemned in the Quran. Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Fir'aun, Fir'aun says what to his people? You are not allowed to think. I will think for you. وَمَا أُرِيكُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَرَى وَمَا أَهْدِيكُمْ إِلَّا سَبِيلَ الرَّشَادِ You know, Fir'aun said, you should not think, I will think for you. And I will lead you into the straight path. How is that possible? Huh? We need a caliber of leaders in our communities and societies, inclusive of, you know, our local mosque leaders, to our local organizational leaders, all the way to our respected Maraja. That says what? That says, come and think with me. Don't let me think for you. 
it is enough, brothers and sisters, that we allow others to think for us. We must think with them. Because this is our God-given right, not to allow our intellectual ability to be dismissed by anyone, except when there is an order from Allah and the Prophet That's a different story altogether. Because Allah says in the Quran, مَا أَتَعْتُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever God gives you, whatever the Prophet gives you, take it. Whatever he prevents you from taking, then leave it. Right? Then Allah says in another uh, verse in the Quran, namely in Surah Al-Ahzab, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا Allah says in Surah Al-Ahzab, it is not befitting for a believing man or a believing woman when Allah and his apostles decrees a matter that they should have a say in the matter. And whosoever disobeys Allah and his prophet, then surely has been misguided, a great deal of misguidance. Well, when it comes to Allah and the prophet, we surrender. We surrender. But when it comes to anyone else, who is a human being as much as I am a human being, I will not allow him to think on my behalf. I must share my thinking with him. Yes, if he had reached a level of intellectuality and standard of knowledge where he is able to extrapolate knowledge on the basis of the Quran and on the basis of aql, intellect, and on the basis of the traditions of the Prophet and the Imams, and on the basis of consensus, and he is qualified to do so. When he gives his edict, his edict becomes law, right? But when it comes to any other issue where an opinion is being expressed, I am as intellectual as anyone else. And I must employ my intellectuality in that regard. And I encourage our younger generation to probe into their intellect and to ask questions and not to feed being ostracized in asking questions in order to strengthen their basis of faith when it comes to their aqidah, when it comes to their religion. No! In Islam, we do not have a mental intellectual quarantine, i.e. we do not have something that is called you cannot think and ask. On the contrary, in Islam, it is perhaps the only religion that had kept its doors wide open to ask any question. And in Islam also, there is no such thing as a question that is called stupid, trivial, or unworthy question. If it is a question, it deserves to be answered. Full stop. Regardless whether the question amounts to the denial of God or not, we have to ask it in order to be able to be in a position to fend our faith on a very solid basis when we are being challenged in colleges or universities or when we go abroad and we meet a professor who sits in his class and says, how do you know that the Quran is not the word or the work of Muhammad? And what happens to us when a professor comes and tells us this? We collapse. We start questioning our own faith. We start to say to ourselves, yeah, maybe, how do I know? Why? Because I do not have a strong basis to rebut such a lame argument. And we have always said, and we will continue to say, that if you believe, whether you're a professor, or a PhD holder, or a master's degree honors, wherever you are, and you teach in any college or university, and you want to challenge us on our Quran, bring Terry Jones with you, and the father of Terry Jones. Who cares about all these people? Bring them, right? I don't know whether you heard about Terry Jones or not. Okay. Terry Jones who wanted to burn the Quran in the state of Michigan. You know the argument of a layman, the argument of a defeated person, is that he does not come and debate you intellectually. He debates you on the basis of his muscles. Right? Burning the Quran is not, not going to take the Quran away from the hearts of Muslims. Right? In fact, one of your British old parliamentarian, when Pakistan was not yet divided or under division from India, he stood in the Indian parliament and said, 
The only way you can part the Muslims away from their faith is if you take this away from them. And he held a copy of the Quran. So a junior parliamentarian got up to the stage, to the video, to the podium, took the Quran and started ripping it. He said, that is not what I meant, you stupid. What I meant is take the faith of people in that book from their hearts. If you read its pages, the pages of the Quran are already inscribed in their hearts and minds. It's not about paper. It's about the knowledge that this Quran holds in the minds of people. It's the knowledge, the faith that is inscripted in the hearts of these people. Okay, you want to falsify the Quran? Come and falsify it on the basis of its data. Quran gives certain data in its information system. And falsification is a standard law in any science. For example, if I claim now in front of you that water is made of H2O4, you can easily falsify it. Why? Take it to the lab, break it down, you will find that water is made of H2O. Two hydrogen atom, one oxygen atom. Right or wrong? That's the constituents of water. But if I come now and say, no, water is made from H2O, H2O3, you laugh at me and say, this is easy falsified. falsified. I tell you, here's the Quran, take it. Put it under any lab of intellectual mind and go through its data. And if you are able to falsify it, I will change my idea now. Now, now I will change it, right? If I am giving you that challenge, that means I am so sure of my faith in that book. And that is what I want my students, my brothers, my sisters, when they go to colleges, not to be frightened or taken by surprises when a professor comes and says to them, how do you know that your Quran is not made by Muhammad? I'll say, easily I'll tell you it's not made by Muhammad. On the basis of the information and the data that is contained in the Quran. For example, Allah says that the more you go into heaven, the more you would be out of breath. Right? Disprove that fact. Now if you can't disprove it, here comes the challenge. No one knew that the more you go up in heaven or in, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the sky or in, 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 in the space will cause you to lose your oxygen. That was known in the 20s or the 30s or even the 50s. No one knew that before. No one had access to knowledge at the time of the Prophet and all the way down until they put the first man in space. That if you go up, there is no oxygen. No one knew that. But the Quran speaks of that fact 1400 years ago. Here comes the challenge. Who told Muhammad to write it? Who told him to write this piece of information? That the more you go up in space, the more you'll be out of breath. Now you would think, ah, oh, this is easily established. But who could establish such a fact 1400 years ago? Okay, another established fact. Allah mentions four stages of the embryological growth in the womb of a mother. Science comes to corroborate each and every stage. Now who told Muhammad to list in immaculate terms the four embryological growth of stages in the womb of a mother? Who told him? No one knew. Huh? They only knew recently, like uh, in the late 80s or early ages, that there are four separate stages of growth. And not only that, the Quran comes and gives you a description. He says the first stage is when the oven meets the sperm. Then they go into the womb, they form the first stage, ala. The clinking or the clinching of that small tiny animal called the sperm with the oven, to form the embryo into the inside womb of a mother. Allah mentions its alaq. Science comes and says what? Science comes and says this embryo in its first stages attaches itself to the wall of the womb. Allah says yes, it attaches itself to the wall of the womb. Who told Muhammad? What, Muhammad had the ultrasound? He didn't have ultrasound. 
Huh? He didn't have a, a, a theater to operate on a woman in her early stages and to start recording information. Ah, the Greeks knew that. I will challenge you if the Greeks knew that. Huh? This is a myth. No one knew about it. Then it goes into a different stage. Then it goes into a stage of mudra. What is mudra? A chew-like animal or stage. You chew like animal state. Mudra is if you take a chewing gum and you actually chew it and then you throw it out, it will give the shape of the next stage of embryological stage in the womb of a mother. This is precise details, brothers and sisters. No one knew about it. Mudra, alaqa. Then Allah SWT says, then we cover the bones, then the bones, then we cover the bones with flesh. Who knew this? That after the mudra, then the alaqa, then the, the, then the bones, then the flesh. You know? Then Allah says what? Then that formation turns into a completely different embryo. Now it develops its real sense of life. So that if you go under the microscope or under ultrasound, you see a full grown baby with limbs and hearts and eyes and ears and what have you. Right? And then comes also the most fascinating information, but not in the book, in the Quran. Although it is part of the Quran, because when the Prophet speaks, it is as if Allah is giving that knowledge to the Prophet وسلم, because Allah said in the Quran وَمَا يَلْقِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَى This Prophet does not speak of his own glory. He speaks of what has been revealed to him. Alright. Uh, it is recommended by mothers in the early stages of embryology, of embryological growth that the mother should sit down and speak to her baby. Subhanallah. Gynecologists and embryological experts and psychologists all are unanimous brothers and sisters that at the early stage of three months to four months of pregnancy the first the first faculty that a child develops in his growth inside his mother's womb is the faculty of what of least name subhanallah the Prophet says, it's good to sit and read Quran to your child. It's good to come and have that affinity with the child. Talk to him. You know? And that's why sometimes in the West you see a dad coming close to his wife and he's talking to his child at the age of three months in the pregnancy of his wife. And he say that develops an affinity between the dad and that embryo. So that when that embryo comes out, he is familiar with the sound of his mom and dad. Subhanallah. So moms, don't listen to Amy Winehouse. Because the child is going to come out and think that Amy Winehouse is his mom. Okay? Don't put Michael Jackson or Lady Gaga. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا Lady Gaga. Huh? Or Pink. Tomorrow we'll get purple. After tomorrow, we'll get, I don't know what, orange, or bananas, or what have you. Pink is a singer. Huh? We listen to these things, and then when our children become corrupt, what do we do? We go to ritual Islam. What is ritual Islam? We come to Maulana. Maulana, can you do ta'weez over his head? But you already corrupted the hell out of him. What is the ta'weez going to do to this guy after that? Nothing will do. What will help that particular child is the training from his early growth. From his early growth, from the early seven years to the next seven years to the last seven years. Right? This is what is going to maintain your child in a level of understanding and growth that will be in correspondence with his needs in these three different stages of growth. Where in the first seven years, the Prophet says, let him live like a prince. You know? Just like we are told in history, Imam Hassan comes and climbs on the back of Rasulullah. Imam Hussein climbs on the back of Rasulullah. Rasulullah is in sajda. Huh? This is practical Islam, not ritual Islam, brothers and sisters. 
Rasulullah is in sajda, leading the Muslims in a public forum, in Salatul Jama'ah, in congregational prayer. Imam Hassan comes and jumps on his back, the Prophet prolongs his sajda. You know, one of the people who is narrating the hadith, he says, the Prophet took long, so I lifted my head. And his salah has gone past, by the way. All right? Yeah, because he cannot lift his head in the, in the salah and then go back to sajda. His salah is gone. But he says, I lifted my head to see what's going on. I see that little grandson of the Prophet on his back. And the Prophet is just in total submission to Allah. Then, eventually, Imam Hassan goes down at his own convenience. We don't go like this bash the hell out of him. Huh? We don't tell the wife, God help me, God help me when I married you the first day. Because I knew you were full of trouble. How many times I told you, I don't want to see my son crawling on my musalla. Or my, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the namaz thing. The, we have, we create a major fight with our wives because my son came and he sat on my musalla. Or he came and took my mohr. Who World War Three will be declared in the house? <laughs> you know, because my mohr has gone. Rasulullah stays in sajda. Then he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, why did you prolong your sajda? He said, My darling, my grandson, Imam Hassan, came and jumped on my back. So it is not befitting for me to disturb his fun. Allahu Akbar. Ya Rasulullah, you are in communication with Allah. You are worried about the fun of your grandson? He says, yes, it is part of my communication with Allah to part away my love to my younger generation. And then he says, He is not among us who does not show mercy to the youngsters and does not have respect to the elders. This is practical Islam. Huh? This is Islam that we want to impart to others where we show our mercy to old and young. Respect to old and young. And not dismiss their entity even from a younger age. Because if you show respect to that young person, he will reciprocate the same respect later on in life. Mm. But if you demand respect without giving respect, you will not get respect in return because respect is earned, respect is never given or offered. And that's why we see our communities are in total chaos. Huh? In total chaos. You go to Tariq Road. Sorry about this. Everyone is pumping everyone. Everyone is knocking everyone. There is not a word of sorry. There is not a word of excuse me. There is not a word of I'm, you know, I I, I encroach on your space. I I will probably dreaming to ask for these things, you know. Cars are going through one another. No one cares. Imagine if someone bumped into you. Who you, who are you? In the standards of some people, right? But in the standards of Allah, in the standards of Allah, causing harm to a mu'min is worse than actually bombing or throwing trash at the Kaaba itself. Undermining the status of a woman is worse in the eyes of Allah than attacking the Kaaba itself. And this is not my statement. This is the statement of Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to the Haram and then he leans his shoulder against the Kaaba. And then he talks to the Kaaba. He says, by Allah, I know your value in the eyes of my Lord. By Allah, I know how valuable your sanctity is in the eyes of God. But by Allah also, the sanctity and sacredness of a mu'min is higher in the eyes of Allah than you. But we don't give any regard to the entity of a mu'min. Yani the entity of a human being. Because Allah says what in the Quran? وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Surely we have honored the son of Adam. That honor is not exclusive to a certain group of people. Because Bani Adam is Bani Adam, brothers and sisters. Everyone! Allah mentioned, you know, today someone asked me, Shaykhuna on Facebook, 
you send a message. Is ribat? You call it ribat, right? Is ribat only a haram against Muslims or against non-Muslims? Look to what level of thinking we think. I said, no problem. Ribat is a crime against humanity. Because Allah says, Wala ba'da. Do not let or allow yourself to gossip against one another. And even, even if I'm gonna admit or accept the argument that says that the riba is only restricted against mu'min, it's haram. Why wouldn't you extend your goodness to other fellow human beings on the basis of your own system of goodness? Why restricted to a limitation of a community that you live among? Why can't you encompass the entire community around the world within you so that you will always be in a state of goodness? That your mind does not think about anything outside the parameters of goodness, regardless of where you are. Whether you are with your family, with your servants, with your workers, with your boss, with your non-Muslim friend, wherever you are, you are always maintaining a state of goodness. That state of goodness, brothers and sisters, cannot be achieved except and until we nourish our souls. It cannot be developed on the basis of your physical existence because the physical existence plays no part in maintaining a paradigm of goodness within your existence. It is your soul and intellectuality that maintains this part of you. Look at us Muslims, for example, we go to the West. This is Allah hurtful, 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 very hurtful. We go to the West, we go into the bank. I will challenge anyone, I will give 1,000 lakh now in rupees to anyone who can jump space or spot in a queue in a bank. Go, go to America, or go into the, any, any bank, and there is a line, go and jump queue. Jump it if you can, you want. Why? Because you know there is a certain what, there is a certain standard that you have to keep. We live in those environments for 20 years lining up. We go to Hajj overnight, we bash one another. Why? Because it is not an inculcated system in our spirituality. We've become robots. Mechanically, we follow the concept of lining up. But it is not part of our conscience. Because if it was part of my conscious, it becomes an automatic reaction to any place or space I find myself in. Whether it is in Haram in Mecca, whether it is in the Haram. Oh, you know what? You know what my argument is? But I want to kiss the Hajar, the black stone. If I don't bash someone in front of me, I'm not going to be able to reach it. But you know what? The Prophet said, you don't have to reach it if you can. Because bashing a Muslim is worse than kissing the stone. Is, is better. Not bashing a Muslim is better than kissing the stone. Why? Because kissing the stone is a mustahab act. Right? It's a recommended act. Your hajj will not be affected. However, keeping the sanctity and the grace of a mu'min becomes the bombshell. is a wajib act. See? How we change rituals with practicality. Instead of keeping practical Islam, now we're practicing ritual Islam. Because ritual Islam says what? No, you have to get to the black stone. Otherwise, my hajj is, there's a problem with it. Who says there is a problem with your hajj? There's no problem with your hajj, Habibi. Just go and do your hajj. Go around. Go around not thinking about the people. Let your soul be in a motion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the purpose of your hajj. You are saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. To you, O oh Allah, I respond. Meaning, I relinquish myself, my fantasies, my desires, my lures, my everything so that I can swim in the space and in the ocean of thy love, O oh Allah. I don't care about anything around me. All I care about is to comply with your wishes. 
So why I am here to comply with your wishes, O oh Allah? And then when I leave the sanctity of your mosque, I do not carry the same sacredness and sanctity with me as a paradigm of goodness which Allah has envisaged for me to be when he made me a vice chariot on this earth and become a personification of the commandments of Allah in every space and place I find myself in. Why do I need to be in a particular environment in order to exercise such right? I don't need I will make the environment. <coughs> so if I'm in New York, I will make New York a Hajj space. If I'm in Boston, I will make Boston the Haram of Rasulullah. If I am in Karachi, Pakistan, I will bring the sanctity of Imam Hussein Shrine in my surroundings. And I show the same respect to my environment in as much I show the same respect to that Imam that I reveal and that Imam I respect. Why? Because Imam fought and died for principles, not for rituals. When he said, La wallah, la u'tikum, la ukurru lakum ikrar al abid. I shall never surrender to you like a slave does. Huh? Nor shall I give you the oath like a humiliated person. For by Allah, Allah is Prophet, and the good laps that raised us. And he is referring to his mother, Sayyidah Zahra. And the good laps that raised us deny us the opportunity to give in that easily. We don't give in easily on our principles. We don't just surrender because I live in a particular environment. No, I learn about the environment and I modify my, my level of interaction within that environment so that I can fit in without compromising my principles and my virtues. Yes, I can. Why? Because the Prophet told me to modify my existence when I live in different communities, but not at the cost of my faith. He says, nas Allahu Akbar. What does that mean? To be sociable, to be able to interact sociably within other cultures where you can fit in is half of one's religion. Half of one's religion. How? I don't have to go to New York in the middle of Manhattan and wear a abaya. I don't need that. Huh? I am modifying my existence, but not at the cost of my faith. Why? Because you know our children are being taught in Madrasa that if you wear a tie, you become a kafir. This guy goes to New York, he has to wear a tie the poor child. He comes home with a tie, he says to his dad, am I a kafir now? You're not a kafir for wearing a tie. You're not a kafir for wearing a suit. You're not a kafir for wearing a good pair of shoes. As long as all this setup does not own you. As long as you are wearing it to fit in without compromising your principles. Without selling your virtues. Huh? Without, uh, the, what do we do with the hijab? Here comes the bombshell. Do we take it off and say, I have to fit in? I say no. If you really want to understand the concept of hijab, then listen to that Yemeni Nobel Prize winner that went to New York and she was standing next to Hillary Clinton. And that, you know, uh, Karman, her name, Karman. I don't know if you heard about her. She's a journalist from Yemen who won the Nobel Prize with full scarf. She stood next to, you know, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, who wants to look like 40 when she's 60. Doesn't matter, that's her <laughs> choice. Anyway, with 17 shades of foundation. Oh, I don't know what, three or different four layers of, makeup, of, of lipstick. Who oh, God knows what else. And this Karman is standing next to her. A journalist wants to embarrass her. He says, you are a very progressive and modern Muslim. Yet, you kept your scarf. How do you feel the scarf fits in modern society today? 
she gives him the biggest slap on the face, not literally, intellectually. She says to him, listen carefully, when humanity began, it began undressed. When humanity started to progress, it started to plague itself with dress. When it reached its ultimate intellectual stage, it was fully covered. Now humanity is going backward towards its early stage. That's when they began to undress. So if you want to be an intellectual human being, the way you started, undress yourself. This is an answer. Not someone that comes and thinks hijab restricts you. Or hijab hinders your movement. Or hijab is good when the Quran is being recited. Comes the convertible hijab. You know the convertible hijab? Uh, the convertible hijab is the one that goes up and down according to occasions. You know? That's the convertible hijab. No, be proud of who you are. And if you think hijab is a matter, and I'm not attacking anyone. Hijab at the end of the day is something you need to believe in and wear it. I'm not here to endorse my, I'm saying what you can do with it, how you can utilize it to your advantage, how you can benefit from it and use it as a mean of empowering you, not as a mean of taking your dignity away from you. On the contrary, as a mean of empowering your stand in the society and the community you are in. Why do I say that? Because when you are wearing your scarf of modesty and your dress of modesty, sisters in particular, and brothers also, because brothers think they can wear anything, by the way. Uh, no, you can't. Uh, let me tell you from an Islamic point of view also that brothers who wear certain items of clothing which become an infatuation of the opposite gender are haram on their part to wear that kind of dress. Yeah, and someone who has a biceps like Arnold Schwarzenegger goes and wears a singlet and comes to the mosque with it and then he argues, my aura is covered. No, Habibi, your aura is not covered. Sorry. You are exposing a kind of lure and attachment because it is not only men that feels in a sexual manner. Also women have certain inclinations in that department as well. So why is it justifiable to us to dress in a particular form? You know, the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed is you go to a beach in Saudi Arabia or in Dubai. You see the guys in shorts and singlets and sometimes no singlets. And you see those four women in 13 abayas, you know, going down to swim. And he says, yeah, this is Islam. This is perfect Islam. I say, no, perfect Islam is, you know what? Is you create menless beaches and let women experience their femininity in the way they want to experience their femininity. In the same way you are experiencing your masculinity. And don't tell me, it's okay for her to be clad in 13 layers of clothes. At, le uh, at least I'm taking her to the beach. If you want to feel what she's feeling, you go and put a abaya on and go swimming. And then you show me how you can swim. And don't use this to your advantage. Don't use it to your advantage. She says, the hijab, the question of hijab. Why? It empowers a woman. It empowers a woman because when you go out in public in your dress of modesty, you are telling every man out there, when you want to mess with me, come and mess with my intellect. Don't mess with me from here down. It's none of your business. Right? You want to mess with me, mess from here up. And I will put you in your spot. The day you try or the moment you want to crack one word out of place, then I will put you in your place because now we are talking at the same level of intellectuality. Right? Then we know the meaning of being in power. Then when that person knows not to mess with you because now you are an intellectual human being that knows her position not by virtue of being forced, but by virtue of being in a choice to be who she is and what she is, that is real empowering of women. But the empowering of women by undressing her to suit the fashion statements and the folks 
of Milan and Rome and New York and Paris catwalks, this is not liberation. This is subjugation. Subjugation to a certain standard of clothes items. You know? And the funny thing is you go to a shop which markets fabrics. Like in Australia, we have a shop called Spotlight. That Spotlight is like the size of a soccer field. It only sells fabrics. Most of the items, it says it's fabric material. You find a, a woman going inside there to buy fabrics in a place that has fabrics the size of a soccer field. And she says, give me 75 centimeters. Excuse me? 75 centimeters for what? He says, I want to make a skirt. Are you serious? With 75 centimeters? What, for a Barbie or for you? That is for me. And then we say that this girl is liberated. Liberated? Yes, yeah, she is liberated from every dress. Right? But she is not liberated on the basis of keeping her modesty in order that people can level at her in the basis of her intellectuality. Now if you come and speak to me about my knowledge, that is what is lasting. And brothers, especially brothers, I'm telling you now, sorry sisters, you are all beautiful women. Don't invest in marriage on the basis of someone's beauty. It becomes a liability. <coughs> it's not an asset. It's a liability in every sense of the word. Because God help you when the Botox runs out. <laughs> and then you have to pump it again. All right? The fee is that big. All right? And of course, I'm not saying all our women are like that. But it seems we want the West, the environment we are living in, is gearing us towards thinking along those lines. That if today's women are not 99.9 .9 plastic, then she does not fit the requirement of marriage. I say that is not an investment. This is a liability. If you want to invest in marriage, invest with someone that has akhlaq, that has morals, that has dignity, that is intellectual, that can raise alongside you a generation that is able to become leaders later on in the world, you and her, not only her, you and her together, then you know what? Allah will give you the beauty as a bonus. Allah will give you the beauty as a bonus. But choose for the right reason, not for the wrong reasons. Then you will be happy and you will lead a life that is based on contentment. I always turn into marriage. I don't know why. Anyway, let's continue. What does this guy say, that doctor? That doctor says from the Corus Medical Center, in regard to the absence of the soul, he says, spiritual belief is a powerful force and doctors cannot afford to ignore it when 60 to 90 percent of patients visits are in the mind body realm majority of people who go to doctors are going for this right just like i said last year i think in this community or in another community i said the problem that people are going through today is what? Is that they think it is vogue and it is part of fashion to always declare in a, in, a, in a setting or a gathering that you feel depressed. It's fashionable these days. It is so fashionable to say, you know what guys? Especially college students, I'm depressed. It's vogue. You know, it's part of our fashion statements today to say I am depressed. Why do you want to be depressed? Why do you want to go through the volumes and values and what have you in your system just so that you know that you fit into the society and what others are suffering from, even if the others are suffering from an illness, I still feel the need to fit in. Huh? I cannot even say I'm healthy. Really? In today's environment, you have no stress? No, I know. Something odd about you. Achieve. Why? It has to be odd. If I'm content, because the society dictates that. The society I'm in dictates that. And when the society dictates that, then we follow. 
And when we follow, that is when we find ourselves trapped, brothers and sisters. We find ourselves trapped into a system that is dictating its terms against us. Whereby we are no longer able to stand on our feet and dictate our terms on our current situation that we find ourselves in. And then we find ourselves in a total mess. We find ourselves in a total mess. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I've already been uh, given the, the time up. And uh, did I really speak for 45 minutes? Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyway, he says spiritual belief is a powerful force and doctors cannot afford to ignore it when 60 to 90 percent of patient visits are in the mind body real. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows us better than anyone inside out has this to say and I conclude. And whosoever abandons the remembrance of the most merciful indeed shall lead a miserable life. Depression, or confusion, or perplexity, or you know, you don't know what you want to do. And today, subhanAllah, today, there was a, 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 an item of news. I didn't know about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planted in that way. Yesterday I was speaking about Amy Winehouse. Today the news is speaking about her ex-husband. I don't know if you heard the news. Wallah al Today, what happened to the guy? What happened to him? is he had an over, overdose of drugs and alcohol. He went into a coma as a result of that. He's not a pop art guy. He's very famous, her ex-husband. I'll get you his name now. I forgot his name, but I wrote it down. Guess what happened to him, brothers and sisters, as a result of overdosing on his drugs and his alcohol. He could not be in control of himself. Sorry to disappoint you. I'm sorry to maybe offend your tastes. But that is what the news says. The reason why he went into a coma is that he swallowed his own tongue in the process. He could not control himself anymore. And then I go willingly to the bar to drink. And I say what? I say I want to have fun. What fun? What fun I'm giving myself when this piece of news tells me that you can, as a result of pinging on alcohol and drugs, swallow your own tongue in the process. Ajeeb. Ajeeb. How the human mind can be reduced to such a small level of thinking when we willingly surrender our intellectuality to our what? Desires and lures. To our desires and lures in that regard. Anyway, there was someone who never surrendered to desires and lures. And that was none other than Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salam. I will not take much of your time. But you know, when Imam Ali was leaving his house, observes S. Oakley in his famous work, The History of the Sassans. He's a very famous writer. Look what he says about Imam Ali in his book, salawatullah wa salam. Ali. He says, when Imam Ali was leaving towards the door, to, to his last abode, the birds in his house start to flap its wing and starts to raise their voices. One of the servants of Imam Ali attempts to quiet them down. This Oakley says this. He says that Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Leave them alone, for their cries are only lamentation for holding my death. They are, are announcing my death. Leave them. And death is not a bad thing. Leave them in the, in the mind of, in the mindset of Ali ibn Abi Talib, brothers and sisters. Death is not a bad thing. It's moving from one stage into a cleaner stage. A cleaner stage. Not a worse stage, a cleaner stage. So Imam, sallallahu alayhi wa on that day, on the fateful hit or strike, he also tells Imam Hassan and Hussein, don't come with me to the mosque. SubhanAllah, don't come. Offer your prayers at home. It's like he knew. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi what was going to happen. But listen to what Imam Ali salawatullah wa salamu alayhi says towards the end of his life. He's breathing his last. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. This is what he says to Imam Hassan and Hussein. He says, O oh, Hassan and Hussein, remain steadfast on the, verse, on the basis of your piety and resign yourself to the will of God 
never aspire to anything which is beyond your reach. Look below you, don't look above you. Subhanallah. Look below you, you will be content. But when you look above you, you will never be content. You will always think you are worse off than people. But when you start to look below you, you will know that you are better off than many, many, many people. Subhanallah. Many people in your heart. Always be truthful and merciful towards the orphans. Allahu Akbar. Allah, Allah, fil aytam. La yadi'u fi hadratikum wa la tahubbu afwa'ahum. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I, I make Allah your guardian over you in regard to the orphans. Let them not be wasted among you and let not your greed allow you to take away their sustenance in life. Make sure that this sustenance comes before your sustenance. وَلَا تَغُبُّوا أَفْوَاهَهُمْ يعني take, Don't take their food away from your, their mouth and feed it to yourself. Help the poor and the needy and try to live in the world in a way which may help it to become better. Allahu Akbar. Live in the world in a way where you will be the cause of helping this world to become a better world. يعني, you know, the adverse of this statement, يعني, don't be the cause of this world going bad. That is what Imam Ali is saying in reverse. If you cannot be someone that the world will benefit from you, don't, don't be something else. Don't be something else in a way which may help it to become better. Stop the tyrant from his oppression. Assist the afflicted and act upon the commandments of God. And do not be put off by any obstacles. Lastly, I say to you, Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying, I ask you to bury me in some place which is unknown to the public. No less than 10,000 people have been killed. Have I killed by my own hands on different occasions. And I do not wish their relatives to violate the sanctuary of my repose and expose my corpse to in, in indignity. You know, this is Ali ibn Abi. Although his grave was be, became known later on in the city of Najaf, there is no denial of that, right? But a fact is that Ali ibn Abi Talib, only enmity from others is that he fought for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of his religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal and bless such a great human being called Ali ibn Abi Talib upon which some unlearned person today on Facebook because I posted an article on Ali ibn Abi Talib highlighting his closeness to Rasulullah calls me a kafir. I say thank you. Thank you so much that for the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib which Rasulullah describes him as his own brother we are called kafirs. I will speak on the subject of calling one another kafir. So we will see. If someone calls us kafir, what should be our reactions, brothers and sisters? And how should we defend ourselves when we are being, when we are called? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise the rank of Ali ibn Abi Talib the day he was born, the day he was martyred, and the day he will be resurrected. On the day of judgment, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibina al-tahirin. I request you kindly to recite Surah Al-Mubarakat al-Fatiha for the loved one of those who have helped make this venue come true and for the departed souls of all those who are gathered here tonight. Proceeded with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.